Right. Hi, everyone. So as Jamie said, I am the equity officer for this session and for the debate tonight. Basically, equity is like an important element for debating because it ensures everyone has an enjoyable experience. So what we basically ask is that, you know, you don't use any abusive language or slurs. And even though it's all virtual, just refrain from making any distractions that will take attention away from the speakers or that might be perceived as disruptive. You are all very clever and I'm sure you can imagine what that would look like. So um, if you have any like points of concerns or issues, you can anonymously report them using the equity form that I posted earlier on the event. And I will also post the equity form again in the chat just for you guys. Um, you can also personally PM me if you'd rather not, and I will do my best to mediate and resolve any issues that you have. I hope tonight is going to be an exciting debate. It will be, and thank you, and I hope you enjoy tonight's debate. Thank you very much, Fian. Right, so we'll move on to the uh, speakers for tonight. Uh, oh, the equity form. Thank you, Fian. Um, speakers for tonight. So. First, the Prime Minister for the motion, this house as the University of Aberdeen would fire George Boyd. That's uh, Jack Vogue, please. Jack. Right, so as people may know, I've been quite vocal about this. I've been doing quite a lot of activism around this. So I think, um, so, here's, so here's my reason. So um, I'm gonna give uh, my personal example. So for some of you may know that I needed to go down to Dundee in order to go to, um, see, um, to do medical appointments and um, and assist family that were in uh, that were in self isolation in terms of like how like making sure that like there was get there was food being delivered to the house and those sorts of things for the duration of my stay in Dundee because I did not want to break local guidelines I at my own expense booked five nights in a hotel this is theoretically what George Boyd should have done when going down to Cardiff in order to see uh, in order to seek the um, the aforementioned medical advice the guidelines are spe are very simple he broke them so why do I think so my, my case today is that I think it's in the, in the University of Aberdeen's interests in order to prevent reputational damage in or um, to fire George Boyd so the reason being is that so far heads have rolled in the um, over the course of people breaching pandemic rules, a good example of that being Catherine Calderwood making a uh, unauthorized, uh, the timely chief medical officer for Scotland, making an unauthorized trip from her home in Edinburgh to a, to her second home in Fife while on um, while we were under full national lockdown. And if I remember correctly, she resigned within a day of that news breaking. So I think that. There is precedent there that you could arguably say that people who breach restrictions should resign. And I think that that also applies to various people who have also breached restrictions, like, say, Dominic Cummings, Margaret Ferrier, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my main, <coughs> main point. And obviously, in terms of BP, I'm now going to go up and talk about a little bit about definition. So obviously, there's not that really much we need to say. But when we say we'd fire George Boyne, as in we, uh, we as the University of Aberdeen, so as the university administration, we uh, believe it is in our interest to, to sack George Boyne from, uh, from his job and seek a replacement as vice chancellor and principal of the University of Aberdeen. So, um, so yeah, reputational damage. I don't think, um, so I think that there are many people across um, across the academic world in the UK, um, in the UK and across the world that are fit to take the job of vice chancellor of the University of Aberdeen it is not going to be that hard for the university to seek out a replacement there are many many people um, in terms uh, many many people qualified for doing this George this is in fact just as an example this was George Boyne's first um, uh, for, if I remember correctly, uh, his first job as a vice chancellor and his first and one of his first academic posts. Um, so, I, so there are definitely people out there who would probably be interested in the post of running of being the head of quite, of like the fifth oldest university in the English speaking world. Um, mm -hmm. Other than uh, and there would be people more experienced than him for whom this is his first vice chancellorship. So therefore, um, so therefore, you can clearly even outside of the COVID metrics find that there are probably candidates out there that are better than George Boyne. And secondly, I think within common metrics, I think that it's, if you fight, if you don't sack George Boyne, the university have the possibility to come across as being a soft touch for having one rule for them, one rule for us. The University of Aberdeen in particular, even compared to other universities in Scotland, has been doubling down on the breaches will not be tolerated rhetoric. When Glasgow was offering rebates on rents to its students in halls and, um, and uh, um, <coughs> Aberdeen was charging, 
seven, Aberdeen University was charging £75 a week in order to go and to, um, to feed, um, for food deliveries to self-isolating students in Wavell House, which it had locked down. So I think um, while Glasgow, um, while other universities, uh, Aberdeen in particular, have been treated... <coughs> <coughs> Aberdeen in particular have been one of the strictest universities when it comes to that lockdown. Therefore, it comes across as one rule for them and another rule for us. If they let <coughs> the head of the university um, go and breach lockdown rules that they themselves are threatening to fine and expel students for, that is a, it comes across as a double standard and um, it comes across as a, very, as a double standard and therefore there is a big chance of reputational damage to the University of Aberdeen if they let George Boyne continue <coughs> in, his job, um, in his post for much longer. Therefore I, think, uh, therefore, I think that it's in the University of Aberdeen's interest to fire George Boyne. Please propose. Thank you very much for that speech, Jack. Very well done. Now we move on to the leader of the opposition, uh, Zach. Is Zach here? Yes. Um, right, Zach, yeah, hello. we'll give you five minutes starting from now. Okay, um, addressing, like, if you look at the situation and you break it down essentially, uh, it's a private health matter. And if we're, if we're talking about uh, lockdown restrictions as a whole, the reason you know, it, would, it would be a punishment is because he broke uh, the laws which are in place to protect health. I mean, if he's gone to Wales to protect his own health, what's the point in that essentially? Uh, so if he did everything he could at the end of the day, it was mentioned before that he could have stayed in a hotel. Um, but the, the the problem we all know that laws don't necessarily don't, don't work uh, unanimously. So that's the problem with deontology as a whole is that things don't don't really work like that. If you have um, the laws in place to protect health, and then he needs to break the laws in order to protect health, or well, he should really do that. Then in that case. There's a, there's a lot in the air with this and there's a lot kind of floating around. At the end of the day, I think he did do the right thing uh, in terms of staying at his son's home. Um, I'm, I, I don't know the facts myself, but I'm sure he was sensible there. He, he probably didn't throw a hundred person party like some students around the UK have done. Um, so as a whole, I think he was uh, doing everything he could in his interest. Um, the, the question isn't, the post isn't, well, was he right to do that? It wasn't, um, is he doing the right thing? It should we fire him? So that if, even if he did do a bad thing or a slightly bad thing based on what he's done, does that mean the university should fire him? Well, no, I don't think so. If we look at his intention, his intention was to protect his own health. Brilliant, he did that. Well, if you look at his action, as far as, far as I'm aware, he didn't contract or help, help increase the spread of coronavirus at all. As I said, I don't know the exact facts. He might have been reckless about it, but I think he was a reasonably sensible man. He probably, he probably was um, careful with it. The only reason that there is an implication in place is because there is the potential, there's the possibility to, of course, harm to spread the virus. And well, there's potential in everything we do to cause harm. And he, that was, it, it's a double effect, essentially. That wasn't his intention to do. His intention was to protect his health. Uh, I think he did the right thing, and even if e even if uh, come to the conclusion he did the wrong thing, that doesn't mean he should be fired from his position. Yes, there may be uh, benefits for the society of the university. Yes, it may be a stain on the university if they don't fire him. But at that point, you're putting the university as a whole above um, above one man and his his rights. And like just just because it would be beneficial to essentially use him as a means to an end to protect the university doesn't mean it's right. I mean, it's just, it should happen. So. Um, that's me done really just uh, it's not the right thing to do to buy him even if he is did illegitimately break lockdown sorry thank you very much zach for that sure. um that was zach leading the opposition uh to um the side for not firing george Boyne. now we move back to proposition once again um javier are you yep. yes okay. yes fantastic yeah, we'll okay. give you five minutes starting now thank you so um, when Dr. Neil Ferguson and, as mentioned by my companion Jack, Dr. Catherine Calderwood both were caught breaking lockdown regulations back in the first quarter of the year, they resigned almost immediately. But when Dominic Cummins made a 260-mile trip from London to Durham at the end of March, breaking lockdown rules that had recently been imposed, calls for his resignations were soonly prompted. 
And in this case, the government and Mr. Cummings claimed that his actions were justifiable. The government's official response was, we believe that Mr. Cummings has behaved reasonably and legally. There are several parallels between this last incident and what brings us to this house today, especially the fact that both the accused parties claimed that their actions were justifiable and essential. However, there is a problem with this argument. The word essential is not mentioned anywhere in the COVID-19 regulations put in place across the four nations. Even if the trip made by Professor Boeing was indeed essential, nowhere in the regulations it is mentioned that essential travel is exempt of the rules. The truth is that regardless of the reasons behind the principal's actions, a mere apology does not correct the damage that he has done to his institution, our university. Couldn't his trip wait? The opposition claims that the travel was justified because it was made to protect his health. So let's assume that it could not wait. Even if it was for medical reasons, surely there are plenty of qualified practitioners in the NHS Grampian who could have seen his medical case and provide care for him locally. Professor Boyne's trip was more than four times the distance for the chief medical officer, Dr. Calderwood, traveled before she resigned. And yet the authorities in Wales, in Wales where the principal traveled, apparently assumed, assured that no further action was going to be taken. While for the other incident, Police Scotland Chief Constable Ian Livingstone raised a public warning to Dr. Calderwood over Twitter. Just before the current term started, the principal sent emails to each and every one of the students stating that the NHS advised that the university staff, uh, advised to the university staff that a number of students had tested positive for COVID-19 at different student residences. By the way, to all of those students, I send a huge grit of solidarity and I hope that they recover promptly and that they have the strength to, uh, the strength to endure this terrible situation. So continuing, on the 22nd of September, Professor Boyne said, and I quote, the safety of our students, staff, and wider community is our absolute priority. And we stress again the importance of following Scottish government guidance. He continued, breaches will not be tolerated and everyone failing to uh, follow these clear guidelines will face action under the University Code of Conduct on student discipline. On another email on the 25th of September, the principal thanked all of the students whose behavior had been ex exemplary and said, we must acknowledge that in recent days, a minority of our students have failed to observe national guidance. This week, the university has written to those residing in university accommodation and emphasized that breaches will not be tolerated and disciplinary action will be taken where necessary. Your well-being is our top priority. So I end my argument asking, why is it that students are continuously being threatened with disciplinary action shall they break the government guidelines, but the principal himself can break said regulations and get away with it by just sending an email apologizing? Maybe Professor Boyne does not realize how his mixed messages lead to rising anxiety among the student body and hinder the mental health of all of those students who sadly have to isolate inside of the student halls. The same students who are struggling to get basic supplies and are facing challenges in what, we, in what will be perhaps their most harsh academic year, without even being able to visit their families when December holiday comes. I quote student George Taylor, who speaking to the present journal said, it is really one rule for us and another rule for them, the university director and staff. We are disappointed and angry. As much as I feel bad for what happened to Professor Boeing and I feel bad for the situation that he's in, I believe that his behavior merits his resignation and shall he continue denying the severity of his actions, he should indeed be fired. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Javier. Mm -hmm. um, now we move on to Robert, who is opposing the motion. Uh, Robert, yes, you're in front of your camera. Um, Right, Robert, we'll give you five minutes starting from now. Okay, what I think we need to look at here is we need to look at what we are angry about and what we do to try and alleviate that. Um, and um, I'm going to firstly look at uh, one sort of slightly out the way because there may be some people and I don't think it's most people here but there may be some people who are angry that George Boyd did this thing and they can't do this thing right there may be some people who are thinking uh, why does he get freedoms I don't now I don't think this is uh, a right line of thought 
um, because um, because of course he should not have done that and neither should anyone else be doing that because it is a public safety risk. So firing him does not fix any issues for these people because that just sends a message that the, the, it's not going to change, you're not going to get any loosened restrictions, right? So this is, we are then left with the, um, the result that we are angry because he broke a rule that he should not have broke, right? And then we need to ask ourselves, is the correct response to that breaking of the rule uh, for the student body and for the university in general uh, to fire him? I'm going to accept George's POI. Thank you. <clears throat> you say, you ask how does it, it doesn't fix anything. Surely it fixes the fact that we are not led by a blatant hypocrite. Um, yeah, I, I am coming on to that because that, that's in the second point. Because if, uh, if you agree that you should be able to move about, you probably don't care he's a hypocrite, you just want to move about. Um, but yeah, on to that. It, it would remove him from the, um, from the vice chancellorship, which would, as you say, remove a hypocrite from that position. But I do not believe that hypocrisy in and of itself is a reason to fire him. Uh, two points on this. Um, firstly, the university is not responsible for the enforcement of the law, right? The university is not responsible for, for uh, punishing him for any uh, breaches of the legal code. It is responsible for maintaining itself and maintaining its own health. So I don't think that should be a, as a reason. I think that if there were if there were criminal proceedings brought against it, that should be uh, handled differently. I'm sorry, no POIs at the moment. Um, so, and this is where we, um, so what we're then looking at is we are looking at whether, um, whether a replacement would be beneficial or harmful. And I think we need to talk about the student body because it's the student body that we care about and theoretically the student body that the university cares about. Mm. And what I would like to say is we are in a very difficult time of uh, the university management because we are um, because we are in the middle of the coronavirus and everything is switching up and going online. This would be a terrible time to bring in a new vice principal um, because you need someone who has had experience with the university, who knows how things work, who has a knowledge of all the different departments and their things doing the administration at this time so that they can most efficiently manage the transition from um, in-person learning to uh, not in-person learning. And I think that uh, while you may gain some comfort from the idea that someone has been fired for wrongdoings, what you do not gain is a better education or a better student life in any way. Um, because, uh, because you would have in someone who would not, who would need to learn the situation afresh, learn things afresh, so you would not get the same uh, smoothness of uh, um, transition to to digital learning, which we so far have mainly got. And also you would get harsher uh, restrictions under a new thing because it would just justify um, the, uh, the punishment of students for these things, which I do not think is fair because I think, um, I think that uh, students, uh, students are in a vulnerable position at the moment and such things as uh, the fine or the expulsion could put them in a state where they are unable to live. And what we are doing, what we would be doing by moving, uh, by firing him is moving towards a harsher stance, moving towards it being acceptable to take retribution against students and take retribution against staff. I don't think that's a place we want to be. So uh, for those reasons, I oppose the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Robert. Um, now we move on to Martin on the side of proposition with his very fancy background will be uh, uh, proposing the motion this house as the University of Aberdeen would fire George Boyne. Uh, Martin. Right so I'm gonna go through a couple points. Uh, 
my introduction is going to be about the trip and itself um that obviously went to wales and although that may not seem like a you know like a serious offense or i mean honestly i would not think that it's something very serious that is worth firing him but as some others said in contrast to how, what the university has put students through threatening us with like academic punishments um, financial punishments as well with like fines this is just it really feels like it's one rule for them and another one for us um i also think there's a couple of things that hasn't been mentioned yet but are quite worrying for example in the email that george Boyne sent us he clearly said that the police in wales was not investigating the trip and it turns out a couple days after that that they were actually investigating although they did not take any measure against it. it. You know, we could still argue that George Boyne lied to students, which is quite a serious offense. Um, now I'm gonna actually talk about why he should be fired, I think, beyond just this trip and, this trip and the fact that he um, broke the rules. Uh, it, first of all, I think like a lot of us may be confused as to what a principal is and what he does in a university. So I found this little definition uh, on the Edinburgh University website, sorry, which says that the principal carries authority and responsibility, uh, that he needs to believe in public service, he needs to be accountable for leading the university and its reputation, um, and is responsible for the management and the affairs of the university and maintain strong governance structures, etc. So I think what really, uh, is important to remember here is that he needs to take responsibility and he is accountable for the image that he gives of the university and the fact that he broke coronavirus guidance is definitely breaking that or you know like going against that uh, these principles that he signed up to when he became principal um, but I think it's also beyond the fact that he broke coronavirus rules um, I think it's mostly what students had to enter at the University of Aberdeen. Um, as Jack said, other universities have handled the whole coronavirus situation much better than Aberdeen, although it was not perfect anywhere, obviously. But in Aberdeen, I mean, the, fa the, the, the email that the university sent us, uh, you know, threatening us if we were to break any rules, um, saying that they were in contact with our landlords, uh, and that they wanted the landlords to contact the university if we were to break rules. This is definitely something that a university shouldn't do. And I think George Boyne should take responsibility for that. We've also seen that people were uh, obviously locked in Wavell House and um, they were offered 75 pounds food package. Like this is definitely terrible as a university to do that. Although George Boyne may not be at the origin of these measures, he as a principal has to take responsibility for that and he should be held accountable for these measures that have been put in place especially when we know that freshers usually don't necessarily know who to turn to if they've got worries if they've got stuff that they need uh, advice for for example these food package you could think that um, freshers may not necessarily question it and just accept it. When I was in uh, Adam Smith, I paid 50 pounds per week for food, which is mad now, but at the time I was just not questioning it. And I think that uh, the university has used freshers, uh, you know, for their own, um, sorry, for their own um, advantage. Um, and the fact that, yeah, they offered them these food packages is quite outrageous because students obviously don't know if they should turn to the university or to AUSA but we know that the university and AUSA could be like quite complacent with what with the university's decisions um, and then obviously there's the shit mental health provisions uh, honestly this this has not been great a lot of students are complaining about that and I think this is quite worrying as well and I think George Bond should take responsibility for that because he hasn't acted on any of these points and he broke, broke the, uh, lockdown rules and coronavirus guidance. And you know, what? It, just ask yourself the question, what if a student had done that? They would have probably been fined or fired, but they would have just not get away with it. So yeah, this is why I, I support the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for the wonderful speech.
Right, and now we move across to the other side of the aisle with Gavin uh, opposing the motion. So, Gavin, you have five minutes starting now. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much to everyone else who's uh, made a speech. I hope you can all hear me uh, quite well. I'm going to give a bit of rebuttal. Um, we had this kind of message from the proposition side, the, the example of Catherine Calderwood, and I think Jack and Javier uh, uh, made this point particularly. What I would say to them is it was a completely different situation when Catherine Calderwood went to her holiday home in Fife as opposed to when um, Mr. Boyne went to Wales. We were in a situation then where everyone was literally locked down in their homes. Nobody could do anything. We are in a much more different scenario now. And the message from governments, whether it be the Welsh government, the Scottish government, the UK government, is much more clouded, it's much more ambiguous. And quite frankly, I think it's much more difficult for people to follow. We also had um, a mention from Martin about how uh, Mr. Boyne is um, almost solely responsible for, for, for the treatment of students in their uh, university halls. I completely disagree with this analysis. I think that you have a situation where several officers, several university staff have made failures, for sure. They have made failures and Aberdeen has, has not come out of this looking well. But I don't think you can lay every single decision and every single bad thing that the university does at the head of George Boyne, just as the, the head of a, of a government can't be directly responsible for things that happened on the ground level. You know, yes, of course, you can, you can lay the responsibility at their shoulders for making decisions that are bad decisions, but that's not a decision that he made, nor a, a thing that was completely within his control. On to the, the thrust of my argument. I know I'm getting a few POIs. I'll take one from George Taylor there. George. Thank you. You say that he's not responsible, but surely he's paid a six-figure salary to be responsible. The buck stops with him. He's the highest paid management position. No, I, I would completely disagree with that. If you look as an example, you know, you have students locked in their halls because of a directive given by the Scottish government, by the UK government as well. I don't think you can necessarily lay the blame at that as a guy who is in that position in the university, it's a completely different thing. He has to do what the government's telling him. He has to, at some point, satisfy the university. Uh, he, has to, he has to abide by those rules. So I, I completely reject that. All, I, I want to move on to a little bit of the thrust of my argument here. Now, I do sympathize you know, quite a bit, but it seems that there's almost a sort of wrongdoing um, in, in, in him traveling to Wales and this. And I, I, I do understand, of course, you know, he did break these local restrictions that were in place in Wales, but would the proposition have us believe that George Boyne shouldn't have gone to treat his illness in Wales? That's something that shouldn't have happened. You know, you wouldn't say to a public official that just because you're in a public role, but you also have an illness, that you can't get that, that, that illness treated because you might be treated as a, treated as a hypocrite. You know, I'm, if we go down this road, then anyone in a public role ever is basically going to have to put the public health of everyone before their own personal health. I think that's completely unfair. I think that's something that we shouldn't do. I mean, there's also a really important point. Nobody understands the rules nowadays. If you go to a county in, in England, say you're in Essex, then you go to Sussex, or you go to another county, or you go to a rural part of, of Wales, you just don't understand the rules. No one understands the rules. And I think it's, a, it's an, an issue and a criticism of government and not an issue and a criticism of a head of a university. I think that's completely unfair. I would also like to bring up briefly the, the example of Margaret Ferrier. It's been mentioned briefly tonight, but we talk about um, the scenario of, or how, how bad George Boyne is. He did not do what Margaret Ferrier did. And Margaret Ferrier has no longer been investigated to the police. We, today, we've just heard that she will no longer be investigated. Now, if you take that example, she had coronavirus, she got on a public transport there and back to London and then back to Glasgow, and she faces no criticism. But yet we're sitting here and the proposition are saying that we should call for his head and we should absolutely take George Boyne out. I think it's completely unfair and I think we need to take to account and take uh, responsibility, I think, uh, a, little bit of a, a little bit of a hard look at this scenario. And I do echo Robert's point of, uh, uh, about the sort of a turbulent time that we're in and, and how it would be a bad timing. 
I mean, you do not change the captain of a ship when they are weather in the storm. And I feel that George Boyne right now has a lot of, to handle on his plate. And the last thing he needs is for people to be running to fire him. Thank you very much. I, I beg you to oppose the motion. Thank you very much, Gavin, for a very fine speech. Right, now we move on to the final whips on both sides of the argument. First up for proposition is George. So, George, you have five minutes starting now. Thank you. Um, so, Jack started us off on side proposition by giving some personal testimony. And so I'd just like to wrap up proposition's argument by also giving a personal view of this to show why Boyne's double standards justify his firing. And then to conclude this debate, see why university management should be handing them his P45, and yet they're not. Jack talked about the reputational damage of the university and that it would not be hard to find another principle, and I totally agree with that. And com in the debate in general, comparing it to other examples, such as with Neil Ferguson or Dr. Catherine Calderwood, I just want to rebut Gavin's rebuttal. They are similar situations, if not identical, is that they are failures of leadership. So we've got to ask this question of why do they get away with it, that Javier touched on. Is it because the university management don't realise how their mixed messaging affects students? Or do they realise and simply not care? We've talked about, oh, it's a private healthcare matter, but it, that fails to appreciate the rank hypocrisy of his act of going down to Wales. We cannot allow this matter to slide. We cannot allow the news cycle to move onwards and for Boyne to get away with it. And let's be honest, it is a private healthcare matter. He thinks he's better than us. He thinks he can go all the way to Wales for private healthcare. He thinks his extortionate salary allows him to break the rules, whilst we students are not. The First Minister herself, when she learned of what Principal Boyne had done, said that, and I quote, the rules should be observed by everyone, regardless of their status. George Boyne obviously disagrees. If he had been an honourable man, he would have had the dignity to hand in his resignation when he was caught out. But instead, he thinks he's done no wrong. He thinks he is in the right despite that. And that is why we as the university must fire him. We must have leadership that is aware of how the rules affect the students. If we want to just compare it to Dominic Cummings and the way he's behaved during lockdown, it's again the very same thing. His wealth and power allows him to get away with stuff. It allows him to get away with breaking lockdown. It allows him to get away without paying council tax on the very second home that he broke lockdown to go to. Coming back to the point about hypocrisy, I have to disagree with Robert here. For leadership, whilst we do not ask our leaders, leaders to be perfect, but we should ask some semblance of empathy, compassion, and justice for our leaders. Dante tells us that hypocrites are the lowest of the low, and as such, the lowest circle of hell is reserved for them. The, then again, Robert says, university is not responsible for the law. But I ask, why are the university so interested in trying to enforce this law against students then? Why are they threatening expulsion and suspension against us if we break it? Why are they contacting private landlords to check up on us? Why are they monitoring the regional newspapers to see whether students speak out on their incompetent handling of 16,000 undergraduates' education. So really, to conclude this debate and to show why George Boyne does deserve his P45, I want to shine a light on how cowardly and perfidious current university management have been regarding the issue. I and a few others, some of whom are in this house, managed to arrange an open meeting with a representative of the university management, the Vice Principal Ruth Taylor. Appreciating that there was a range of student issues, we reached out to other societies as appropriate, and we were planning to discuss the impact of isolation on mental health for students, how the university can make its messaging clearer for students, and the impact of lockdown on courses and teaching. Um, when we planned to do this, which was on Tuesday the 6th, and then on Monday the 5th, this story broke about Principal Boyne, so we added a fourth point to talk about in our discussion, the hypocrisy and whether there would be any consequences of from Principal Boyne's jolly down to the Vale of Glamorgan. That ve the very next day, the university management, perfidious and cowardly, they chose to cancel this meeting with myself and other members of this house and saying that on reflection, it was not the necessary thing to do. So to sum up, we really need to ask whether our university leadership should be uh, conscious of how this lockdown and the restrictions that they have threatened expulsion if we break, how these restrictions are affecting students. If they don't appreciate that, they are obviously lacking in justice and passion, which 
propositions, say, are very much qualities needed in a leader. From my own personal perspective, I have not been able to go home since last Christmas. I may not be able to go home uh, this Christmas either. That is only half the way distance down to South Wales, going down to Manchester. So I think it really is a case of one rule for them and one rule for the others, as I said to the press and journal. So for all these reasons and for the reasons my comrades have said, I beg you to propose this motion and to fire George Boyne. Thank you very much, George, for a very passionate speech. Right, we'll move on to the final floor speech, a uh, table speech of the night before we go on to the floor speeches. So the final speech of the night is from Ethan. Um, right. Can you hear me? The, yes, yes, yeah. we'll give you five minutes starting now. Okay, um, good evening and thank you all for being here. So just a few rebuttals I'd like to make. Firstly, on the Wavell House, I believe two proposition speakers have brought up a, a charge of 75. That policy has, in fact, been changed. Uh, I know that myself. I'm, I'm, I'm currently in isolation in, in lockdown. And um, uh, indeed, two of my flatmates yesterday, you, you fill out a, uh, an absence for COVID form. And the university gives you two big boxes of food with just about everything. So just a, a quick factual rebuttal there that that policy has been changed. Um, Another rebuttal I'd like to make is in terms of the comparison with student breaches. Clearly the comparison with student breaches where you have seen larger crowds to say the very least, and indeed where the police have been called several times to crowds of hundreds is, you know, crowds of hundreds of students, um, you know, in New Carnegie and the police being called is completely incomparable with, you know, um, with uh, George Boyne uh, going to Wales. And uh, in, it's another rebuttal I'd like to make is in terms of the measures that have been brought in. Um, George Boyne is not the dictator of, of measures. Uh, no, I can't, I'm sorry, I'm not taking that now. Um, maybe at the end if I've got time. Um, so I just want to make my points first. Um, so he's not a dictator of measures. In fact, there's, there's about 10 senior management in terms of a number of vice principals, directors, and so on. And you can find this on the university website. So uh, the way people have been talking about it, George Boyne, as a kind of dictator, you know, sort of just handing out decrees of, you know, restrictions on students. As I said, he's clearly not responsible. There's 10 senior management decisions and decisions would have taken been, would have been taken collectively. Uh, Dominic Cummings on, on, on that scenario, um, again, of, of course, a lot of people have made the claim that that um, uh, broke rules, but I, 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 but I think it's important to correct the record on this that the police investigation concluded and there was a proper and full police investigation concluded that it might have been a minor breach. Um, but it's talked about as this, you know, major completely broke the rules. As I said, the police conclusion was it might have been a minor breach. Um, so, you know, the idea that it's sort of, you know, setting this kind of example of them and us is sort of ridiculous. And then onto my points, just to sum up, uh, as I said, uh, as, as was the first speaker said from my side, you know, there was a good intention for his health. Um, even if it helps the uni, that doesn't make it right, clearly. You know, clearly just saying it helps the reputation doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And that's clearly one of the arguments coming from the uh, proposition. Um, obviously, as, as has been brought up, it's a bad time for a new leader. Uh, or, or a new a new vice principal, I should say. You want someone who's familiar, and indeed George Boyne uh, actually studied at the university when he was. I, I know, I know he got. I think he was a double graduate. I believe he was from the University of Aberdeen. So he's someone with a lot of experience, uh, particularly with the University of Aberdeen, and therefore eminently qualified in a way that you could argue um, individuals who went to other universities are, are not. Um, and, and the final point I'd like to make, because I, I think this has been missing the whole debate and it's really, honestly, it's really sort of ticked me off, is that people have been talking about it like that, that you know, people, like all the speakers have been talking about how he broke the rules. What's very clear, and this is not my view, this is the conclusion of the police view, was, uh, and I quote, his actions were reasonable and legitimate according to, I believe it was the South Wales police. Uh, if you'll just give me a minute to check. Um, got the uh terribly sorry um yeah according to south wales police i am pleased to, uh, just to give the statement i am pleased that it has been confirmed by south wales police that my actions have been 
reasonable and legitimate. Therefore, it's not a debate. It's not a matter of, oh, he broke the rules, he broke the rules, them and us, them and us. It's a very clear fact that, you know, according to the police investigation, that he has been found effectively. He's been found innocent. He's been cleared of charges. Um, and so he hasn't broken the rules. This whole debate, we've been talking, oh, he's broken the rules, he's broken the rules, he's broken the rules. He hasn't broken the rules. That's according to the police investigation. Um, and I think people, yeah, it, to my great dismay, I found that people were sort of ignoring that. You know, just saying, now, of course, that doesn't make it right what he did. I'm not saying it was right. And indeed, the same has been coming from other speakers on my side. We're not saying it was right. But was it against the rules? No, it wasn't against the rules, as the South Wales Police Investigation has concluded. Um, thank you for your time. And I beg you to uh, oppose the motion. Thank you very much, Ethan, for a great speech to finish off the table speakers for the night. Um, now we move on to floor speakers. Now, the way this works is a three minute speech um, on the side of proposition, opposition, or abstention to the motion. Abstention being you're either for and against, or you just want to give a general comment about the state of the debate or a point that maybe someone has missed out in the actual table debate. Right, so I will message you when you have a minute left and 10 seconds left for these speeches, and we'll start with the side proposition for this house as the University of Aberdeen would fire George Boyne. So write in the side chat or raise your hand. I, I've seen Maxwell um, for this. Right, Maxwell, do you want to give a three minute speech starting? Um, first, I would like to point out I'm the third person who lives in this flat. There's three of us. We're not just one person making three speeches. Um, so I also want to talk about like what it seems to have come up here is that the police have cleared um, several people on these charges. Uh, because that basically shows us that the charges are essentially toothless. These are two fairly clear um, violations of the Gandans, both which got into the news, in, in, in George Boyne's case, the Welsh news, implying that there is genuinely a case here, it's not just some random stuff. And then they were both cleared by the police. What does this tell us? This tells us that the COVID restrictions are essentially toothless. There's very little people can do uh, that the police can do that are going to do with COVID restrictions. This is especially clear when you realize there are not police blocking the roads to every city. There are not like people scanning cars. There's not even police in our streets. There's like nothing that actually proves the COVID restrictions need to be followed. And in fact, somebody wants to violate the COVID restrictions, they they are basically perfectly free to do so. However, a lot of people don't because a lot, two reasons, a lot of people principally don't because you know, they don't want to infect people and a lot of people don't because they re don't realize that they can just violate it. Um, <clears throat> so what is the problem with people like George Boyd um, violating this? It shows us that the COVID restrictions are essentially to us, to us. It shows us that when major people power, Go, um, go in and have a lot of media attention on them and then the police, like the people who are supposed to be enforcing these guidelines, take a look and should say that they're completely, um, like they're completely fine. It shows us that then for most ordinary people that it, that seems to be the case for them too. And because of they've already illustrated that the police aren't enforcing measures and even though they might not be scared of, you know, um, saying somebody who, that people who are not in power doing things, if they can't catch you, they're not going to prosecute you. What we have is essentially people, uh, allows a lot more people, especially students, to realize they don't have to follow these guidelines. I think this is a problem because the guidelines as a whole for a general population do in fact uh, reduce COVID spread. They do in fact have reasons for existing. They're not just arbitrary guidelines designed to oppress us. Like people, um, they might be like misinterpreted sometimes, like mis they might not be as effective as they could be, but they still exist and they still help. But if you have people who realize that because of the blatant abuses of our people in power, who also know that the system doesn't seem to be properly working, you have um, essentially just allowing anybody to do free reign. Um, and I think that's just like principally, that's just bad. I think that you shouldn't have people in power um, being hypocritical because it's hypocritical allows a, a sets an example for everybody else. Um, especially when you have major news stories about this, for example, in the Welsh media. It reaches a lot of people, a lot of people realize that every time somebody isn't, doesn't have a consequence for this, somebody is not um, responded to, there's no consequences for these actions, you have another problem, you have another situation in which the rules will be broken by a large portion of people, this will stop the virus from going away, and this is a problem for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maxwell, for the first floor speech of tonight.
Um, we now move on to the opposition floor speech. So if anybody wants to oppose the motion, this house as the University of Aberdeen will fire George Boyne. Could they please raise their hands, message in the chat or uh, turn their camera on now? No one? Oh, Derek. Oh, yeah. Yep. Thanks, Derek. So if you turn your microphone and camera on and we'll give you three minutes, Martin, whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I think there's a, a problem here with the guidelines because it's not really designed to cater to individual situations. Um, it seems to be a sort of one sized fits all approach. And that's been my criticism of it from the start, because it doesn't take into account that Professor George Boyne uh, was fearing for his own health by staying overnight with his brother in Wales, and that he needed to see a certain type of medical specialist there. Um, so these types of situations have not really been considered under the guidance, I think. So I think we're holding him responsible just for taking responsibility for himself and making pragmatic decisions based on what he thought was best for his own health. And so I think that's wrong. I get the point that a lot of students are being forced to self-isolate in halls. Thankfully, I'm not this year, but um, I, get, I get that. And it's frustrating when the person who imposes the rules is seen to be breaking them. But I think you've got to look at it on a case by case basis and take into account, is it worth a man losing his job because he took a pragmatic decision that was for his own health? And I would say no. I would say that we it's, it's turned into, uh, we talk about the cancel culture, but it's really on COVID, it's turning into a witch hunt against uh, people who are seen to just slightly break the rules. And when, when Catherine Calderwood was forced to resign, I spoke up against that as well. I didn't think she should have had to resign. So it's not a partisan thing for me. It's just the application of a bit of common sense and uh, a more individualistic approach to uh, how we impose restrictions on people, I think is needed. So I think destroying careers is certainly not any way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Derek, for the opposition floor speech of the night. Now we move on to abstention. Now this can be a for and against, or you didn't agree with anything, or just a comment. Um, if people want to raise hands or turn their camera on now for an abstention speech. Uh, Beth, yes, yeah, so if you want to turn your camera and microphone on um, and we'll start the time when you're ready all right so there's two ways of looking at this like first of all you've got the say it wasn't george Boyne doing this say it was a student doing this they would have been kicked out is my audio working right all right so if a student had done this they would have been kicked out there you, you can make the argument of the police said that George Boyne had done nothing wrong, but had a student have done this, there might not have even been the police going into it. They would have just been kicked out. That's it. You broke the rules. But the police did clear George Boyne of any wrongdoing. It was for medical reasons. It wasn't for any personal reasons. I think this is, yeah, I do agree with, with it being a witch hunt. Because I think people are just in general frustrated with the guidelines. And I think George Boyne is just a convenient figure for people to show their annoyance against because there's some people who've been kicked out of this university. And they're watching the principal of this university get away with doing something and traveling further than they probably did, and they're now kicked out of uni. Uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much, Beth, for that speech for the abstention side of the debate. Now we move back again to proposition. Um, so is there anybody? There we go. 
uh, Gabby, so you turn your mic and camera on and we will uh, start the time when you're ready. Uh, okay, thank you. So yeah, what I would like to say is, uh, first of all, when a person is in a public position, it, it should be uh, kind of like common sense that it uh, that the person is going to get scrutinized for uh, their public actions. So this time, because he, George Boyne, he knew that he was in a position like that. He, he shouldn't have taken that trip or at least made uh, proper accommodations like uh, staying uh, uh, booked a hotel because he is a public person after all. Second of all, like the response from the authorities also had shown that uh, police are in, on the side of those who are in power. So, and uh, they are going to take a side of those in power and not the side of the people. There's a second point. And a third point is just, it is a common sense if a public person does something like that, should uh, uh, resign because uh, maybe he didn't have any symptoms or he wasn't a carrier of a disease, but still he could have possibly have infected himself or have infected others and putting everyone at, at risk. It's, it's not about only about students, but it's also public health concern. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabby, for that. Uh, now we move on to another opposition floor speech. Uh, is that Dasha? Yeah, okay. So Dasha will give you three minutes starting when you're ready. Okay, so. Um, we have been talking a lot about what are the regulations imposed in the university and how students have different uh, regulations than the teachers as it appears because of this situation. However, as far as I know, and I have done some research regarding that, there hasn't been a single student suspended because of breaching COVID regulations. We had parties on campus happening where a lot of people in the student um, um, homes were coming together, breaching those regulations where they were spread, spreading the virus. They were not suspended. Suspension and expulsion are the final result if there are continuous uh, breaches of the guidelines, if there are repeated offenses. The first, uh, uh, what's it called? The English word, sorry. So the first fine is just 250 pounds that you have to pay. So what has happened in this situation is George Boyne did breach according to many people, certain guidelines, although he was found not guilty. It is, however, his first offense. So in what world where the students, after partying on campus, were not suspended, are protesting for the principal to be uh, fired, even though it was his first offense? We can have some form of um, disciplinary action against him. He can face some form of consequences. However, firing him from his position and disrupting the already quite unstable situation that we have in the university because of how they handle the crisis is not a solution. And it is too much of a measure in this situation. So if we can have some patience towards the students because everyone's going through trying times and because everyone is confused and as it has been mentioned by Gavin I believe is that the guidelines are just unclear we don't know what is happening I cannot go over to my best friend to have a tea with her in her flat however for some reason I can meet with her on campus in a Starbucks where I don't wear a mask so how, when the guidelines are unclear, when the guidelines request completely opposing things from people, we can say that we need to fire George Boyne from the university after his first offense. And that's why I believe that this is too much of a measure and I back to oppose. Thank you very much, Dasha. Right, now we move on to another abstention speech for the night, um, Sophie. Raise a hand. So, okay, Sophie, um, 
we'll give you a three minute timer when you are ready. no sorry i just wanted to clap for that oh time. okay <laughs> right uh, sorry okay right so we're still on abstention for this motion um so anyone want to message the chat or raise a hand to speak in abstention if not we will begin again and we'll go back to proposition so no okay right we'll move back to uh proposition so anybody want to give a three minute speech um on the motion this house as the university of aberdeen would fire george Boyne. um Anybody? No? Okay. Anybody want to oppose the motion? Another floor speech? Oh, no one? Okay. Or anyone want to do another abstention? If not, we'll move on to voting and the announcement of next week's debate. Right, okay. Mm -mm. Right, great. Let's move on to the vote for this week. Thank you to everyone who's spoken tonight. Really great speeches all around from everybody. Um, how we're going to do this is going to raise your hand with your camera on. If not, write in the chat on the side, um, I, if you are for the motion, this house as the University of Aberdeen would fire George Boyne. Um, so we'll and then we'll do nay and stay silent if you are on abstention you are neither for or against so this house as the university of aberdeen would fire george Boyne. could everyone please say aye if you agree with the motion or raise a hand so we've got uh that account. Okay, five. Okay, five as well six seven six Daniel camera on uh Eight suits. Eight. Thank you very much to everybody. Uh, that is eight for the motion. And now against the motion, everybody raise your hand if you're against it. Two, so we've got two, two in the chat. Or five, five, five. Five. Uh, Derek, six there as well. Right. That is eight to six. Thank you very much, everybody, for tonight's debate. Everybody incredibly well spoken, really well done. Um, right, now shall we announce next week's debate? Right, next week's motion will be, this house supports the processing of refugees overseas. The motion for next week is again, this house supports the processing of refugees overseas. It is a collab with Lawyers Without Borders and Amnesty and Aberdeen. Um, Thank you to both societies for the willingness to collaborate and we'll see you then. Thank you very much. Yes, there's been a really good debate all round. So thank you very much for coming and we'll see you all next week. Thank you. Thanks.